Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. So Holly, I think a lot of people take for granted the idea that you need to wash your hands to prevent disease. Yes, but also some people discount it. (laughs) Well, and there's also a lot of research that even though this is a pretty ubiquitous and standard idea, a lot of people don't actually wash their hands nearly as much as they should. But regardless of all of that, it was not taken for granted in 19th century Europe, including among doctors, that you needed to wash your hands to prevent disease. And today we are going to talk about Ignaz Semmelweis, who was one of the people who made this connection between hand washing and disease prevention. The disease that he was preventing was childbed fever. And even though it was not taken seriously at the time, like people wrote him off entirely, today he's known as everything from the father of infection control and the savior of mothers and the conqueror of childbed fever, which is a a lot of, I mean, very lofty pronouncements. And he did do amazing work, but it did not last past his lifetime. Uh, This episode also, to be clear, it's about medicine in 19th century Europe and to a lesser extent in North America. And we're definitely aware that religions and cultures all over the world have their own practices about everything from hand washing to delivering babies. It is not about that at all. This is not a global overview of hand hygiene and how it relates to medicine. We're really looking at how the practice of obstetrics and formal medical training collided in the 18th and 19th centuries. And this is also a listener request we've gotten from several people, including Margaret, Tom, and Ashley. Childbed fever, also known as puerperal fever, is a postpartum infection of the uterus or the vaginal canal. And it's often caused by a streptococcal infection, but it can come from other pathogens as well. Today, these infections are largely preventable through hygiene and infection control procedures during labor and delivery, and when they do happen, they're usually treatable with antibiotics. So in places where competent care, clean water, and antibiotics are readily available, puerperal fever isn't very common. This was not the case before the germ theory of disease or the discovery of antibiotics. Until the late 19th century, childbed fever was one of the most common complications of childbirth. Within about three days of giving birth, patients developed abdominal pain, fevers, abscesses, and other signs of infection, and this would often progress to blood poisoning and death. Sometimes incidents of childbed fever were sporadic, and between 20 and 30 percent of those sporadic infections were fatal. But when an epidemic of childbed fever swept through a community or a hospital, it tended to be a lot deadlier with 70 to, with a 70 to 80 percent mortality rate. And a lot of prominent women died of childbed fever throughout history, including Mary Wollstonecraft, Henry VIII's wife Jane Seymour, and possibly recent podcast subject Phyllis Wheatley. Obviously, a lot of ordinary women did too that aren't in the history books. It was something both expecting parents and their doctors and midwives dreaded and feared. Childbed fever was described in medical literature all the way back to Hippocrates in the 4th century BCE. And in the years before evidence-based medicine, people blamed it on a range of causes based on whatever medical theories were in use at the time. So everything from a balance, an imbalance in the four humors to miasmas or bad air. By the 18th century, doctors were devoting a lot of writing to arguing about whether it was an inflammatory or a putrefying disease. In the 18th and 19th centuries, a few things happened in tandem that led to a big increase in childbed fever epidemics. One was that more babies were being delivered in hospitals rather than at home. In some cases, these hospitals were part of social programs. The idea was to provide free care before and after delivery to try to stop infanticide among families that were living in poverty. Some of these hospitals employed midwives and others of them employed doctors. And this was also a change. Before this point, doctors and surgeons who were almost exclusively male had really only been involved in delivering babies when there were really serious complications. It was so unusual for a man to be involved in delivery that in some places these doctors were called man midwives. So the idea that a doctor would be involved in the routine delivery of a baby was fairly new in the 1700s. 
Also fairly new was the widespread use of autopsies as part of medical education. Although autopsies existed well before this point, it was only in the mid-1700s that the field of medicine really started using them to try to improve on medical knowledge and teach medical students. And in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, doctors started using autopsies of childbed fever victims specifically to try to learn more about the disease. All of this together meant that at, the, at about the same time, more people were giving birth in hospitals assisted by doctors, and more doctors and medical students were handling and dissecting cadavers as part of medical study, including the bodies of people who had died of childbed fever. Because illnesses were blamed on things like miasmas and imbalanced humors rather than on pathogens, these post-mortem examinations were being conducted with bare hands, and those bare hands were not usually washed before working with living patients. Surgical gloves weren't even invented yet. That wouldn't happen until the late 1800s, and when those gloves were invented, they were really about protecting the hands from chemicals, not protecting the patients from the spread of disease or the doctors from contracting diseases from the patients. The result of all of this was a dramatic increase in epidemics of childbed fever, particularly in hospitals. One swept through the Paris Hotel Dieu in 1745 and 1746. Another struck the British lying in hospital in 1760. These were frequent and widespread enough that hospitals weren't usually thought of as safe places to give birth. There were definitely doctors who spotted the connection between autopsies and childbed fever or who suspected that the disease could be spread from patient to patient by the doctors who were treating them. These doctors published treatises and journal articles about what they thought was causing childbed fever and how to stop it. In 1795, Alexander Gordon of Aberdeen, Scotland, wrote his treatise on the epidemic of puerperal fever. And in it, he theorized that doctors who had treated a patient with childbed fever could pass it on to other patients. He recommended burning the patient's bedclothes, along with thorough handwashing and fumigating all of the clothing of the doctors and nurses who were involved in the infected patient's care. In 1829, when an epidemic of childbed fever struck the Rotunda Hospital in Dublin, Ireland, hospital chief Robert Collins tried to stop it with a 48-hour chlorine fumigation. He also ordered that all the floors and walls be scrubbed down with chlorinated lime and all the linens be heat-treated. The number of childbed fever cases at the hospital dropped almost to zero after he did all this. In 1843, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. delivered a paper called The Contagiousness of Puerperal Fever to the Boston Society of Medical Improvement. In it, he said, quote, The disease known as puerperal fever is so far contagious as to be frequently carried from patient to patient by physicians and nurses. He then went on to describe a number of steps to try to prevent the spread of the disease. These included that obstetricians should never conduct autopsies on patients who died of childbed fever. And if for some reason an obstetrician had to, he should very thoroughly clean himself, change all of his clothes, and abstain from patient treatment for at least 24 hours. Holmes went on to recommend that if a doctor treated a patient who then contracted childbed fever, he should consider all of the patients that he went on to treat to also be at risk until significant time had passed without anybody else being infected. And if two of his patients developed childbed fever in close proximity to one another, he should remove himself from medical practice and bring in a substitute for at least a month. Holmes's paper made recommendations that would have been both useful and effective for preventing the spread of childbed fever. But it didn't get a lot of attention until it was reprinted as a pamphlet and more widely distributed. And then the response among the medical community was total dismissal and outright mockery. Charles D. Meigs, an obstetrician from Philadelphia, described Holmes's theories and recommendations as, quote, jejune and fizzinless dreamings, and claimed that any doctor who saw an increase in childbed fever was just unlucky. When Ignaz Semmelweis came to the same conclusion that Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. had, the response from the rest of the medical community was very much the same, and we'll talk about it after a sponsor break. 
Semmelweis was born on July 1st, 1818, in the Taban area of Buda, Hungary. Buda would combine with Pest in 1873, so it was a little bit later, to become Budapest. At the time, Hungary was part of the Austrian Empire, and he was the fifth of ten children born to grocer Josef Semmelweis and Theresia Mueller. There's a bit of disagreement about the family's heritage. Some accounts claim that they were Jewish and that anti-Semitism was a factor in later parts of Semmelweis's story. But Sherwin B. Newland, author of The Doctor's Plague, Germs, Childbed Fever, and the Strange Story of Ignaz Semmelweis, writes that parish registers document that the Semmelweis family was Roman Catholic going back to the 1670s. The counterargument is that Semmelweis and his ancestors may have been baptized for the sake of assimilation while the family was still culturally Jewish. But this is largely conjecture, and it seems mostly just to be based on their surname. In 1837, at the age of 19, Semmelweis went to the University of Vienna to study law. A year later, he changed his course of study to medicine, and he graduated with his M.D. in 1844. He looked for a position practicing internal medicine, but he couldn't find one. So he changed his focus once again and looked for a position in obstetrics. On July 1st, 1846, he was granted a two-year appointment as an assistant to Professor Johann Klein, who was the director of the Vienna Allgemeine Krankenhaus, or the General Hospital. Vienna General Hospital was a teaching hospital. So in this role, Semmelweis was both a doctor and a teacher. He supervised and educated medical students, and he assisted with difficult deliveries. He was also the clerk of records, which put him in a good position to spot patterns among the patients and their outcomes. The maternity clinic at the Vienna General Hospital was one of the ones that had been established to provide free medical care to impoverished patients. So patients essentially got free care in exchange for helping with the medical students' educations, Originally, the hospital had one maternity clinic, which was staffed by midwives, doctors, and their students. And after a while, that one clinic became so overcrowded that the hospital opened a second one, which was still staffed by a mix of doctors, midwives, and their students. But around 1840, the two clinics were separated into the first and second clinic. The first clinic was staffed by doctors and medical students, and the second clinic was staffed by midwives and midwifery students. The two clinics alternated admission days, so if the first clinic accepted patients on Monday, the second clinic would accept patients on Tuesday, and so on. When the maternity clinic first opened in 1784, the hospital director, Lucas Bohr, had not included post-mortem work as part of the obstetric student's course of study because he thought it carried a risk of contagion. But in 1823, Johann Klein took over as director and started using autopsies as a teaching tool for the obstetric students. By the time Semmelweis joined the hospital staff, the rates of childbed fever at Vienna General Hospital varied dramatically between the two clinics. At the midwives clinic, between 1 and 2 percent of patients died of childbed fever. And at the doctor's clinic, the rate varied from 5 to 30 percent, with an average of about 10 percent. This difference between the two clinics was so huge and so well known that laboring patients who were told that they were being admitted to the doctor's clinic would beg to be sent to the midwife's clinic instead. Some even gave birth in the street outside the clinic after hearing that it was the doctor's day for admission. And then they would say they had been on the way to the hospital and the baby just came before they could get there. That way they would still have access to the free care at the clinic, but without the risk of death that was associated with it. That's got to be a terrifying choice when you're like, no, I'm I'm just going to do this in the street and then I'll let them take care of me after that. Well, and I imagine a thing I didn't find... um I didn't find sources that said this, but considering that my own mother did this when I was born, I imagine the people that were like, I'm in labor, but I'm not far into labor, and it's the doctor's day. I'm going to wait a few hours <laughs> so I can go to the <laughs> midwives clinic. I imagine that was a thing, too. My my parents did that because if they waited till after midnight, they wouldn't be billed for the extra day. They did not have a ton of money. Semmelweis noticed that even these births out in the street were safer than giving birth in the doctor's clinic at the hospital. He wrote, quote, To me, it appeared logical that patients who experienced street births would become ill at least as frequently as those who delivered in the clinic. 
What protected those who delivered outside the clinic from these destructive, unknown, endemic influences? He became completely fixated on this question. It was appalling and deeply offensive to him that there was such a huge difference between the doctors and the midwives' clinics. So he started trying to figure out what was different between the two clinics and then making adjustments to what the doctors were doing. At the midwives' clinic, patients lay on their sides to deliver. But at the doctors' clinic, they lay on their backs. Semmelweis changed the procedure at the doctor's clinic to use side-lying, but that didn't make a difference. He also noticed that any time a patient was dying in the doctor's clinic, the priest who was arriving to give, to give last rites basically had to walk through the whole ward, and he rang a bell while he was doing this. Semmelweis thought maybe this bell and what it signified was so terrifying that it was making people sick, so he got the priest to stop it with the bell That did not fix the problem. He looked at how crowded the two clinics were, and it turned out that the midwives' clinic was, understandably, far more crowded. He looked at the religious practices of the people working in each clinic. He looked at the patients' diets, and none of these things seemed to make a difference. Then his friend and colleague Jakob Kolechka died of what appeared to be childbed fever after accidentally being nicked with a scalpel while performing an autopsy on someone who had died of it. And Kolechka's own autopsy results were very similar to those of childbed fever victims. That's when Semmelweis realized that midwifery students weren't performing autopsies as part of their training. Only the medical students were. Another difference was that the medical students were performing vaginal examinations on their patients as a routine part of their care, while midwifery students only did so when there seemed to be a need for one. Semmelweis's conclusion was that some kind of cadaverous particles were being transmitted from the autopsies to the patients in the doctor's clinic. In mid-May of 1847, Semmelweis started instructing doctors and medical students to wash their hands after conducting autopsies. They were to use chlorinated lime until their hands had no trace of the putrid smell that was left behind by a decaying body. He chose chlorinated lime because it seemed to do the best job of getting rid of the odor. But chlorinated lime is calcium hypochlorite, which today is sold as powdered chlorine bleach. Chlorine bleach is, of course, a disinfectant. With Semmelweis's hand-washing protocol in place, the rate of childbed fever mortality in the doctor's clinic started to drop. It had been 18.3% in April, and by June, it had dropped to 2.2%. In August of 1847, for the first time since the medical students started performing autopsies, no one died of childbed fever in the doctor's clinic. Semmelweis couldn't exactly explain why this had worked. At one point, another outbreak of childbed fever spread through the clinic, even though there had been no autopsy to trigger it. So Semmelweis began to suggest that some patients might make their own so-called cadaverous particles in their own bodies, rather than the autopsies being their only source. Later on, he revised his hypothesis a third time, saying that the cadaverous particles could come from any decaying animal flesh, not just from a human body. The fact that he couldn't adequately explain why his protocol worked became one of the arguments against his findings. While some of his medical students agreed with and supported his work, most of the established doctors at the hospital dismissed him completely. Director Johann Klein insisted that it was the clinic's new ventilation system, which was getting rid of dangerous miasmas, and that should get the credit. Other doctors also vehemently disagreed with the idea that their own hands could have been what was spreading such a devastating, painful, and emotionally wrenching disease. It was unfathomable to them that a doctor could have dirty hands in the first place. In their minds, doctors were gentlemen, and a gentleman's hands were always clean. And as word of Semmelweis's protocol spread beyond the hospital, doctors were also resistant to the idea of washing their hands because they didn't necessarily have access to clean water where they worked, and also because it was time-consuming. I like this weird chicken-and-the-egg thing where, like, A gentleman's hands aren't clean because he takes such fastidious care of himself, but just because he's a gentleman. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Later on, Semmelweis would describe it this way. 
quote, most medical lecture halls continue to resound with lectures on epidemic childbed fever and with discourse against my theories. The medical literature for the last 12 years continues to swell with reports of puerperal epidemics. And in 1854 in Vienna, the birthplace of my theory, 400 maternity patients died from childbed fever. In published medical works, my teachings are either ignored or attacked. The medical faculty at Würzburg awarded a prize to a monograph written in 1859 in which my teachings were rejected. So he wrote that a little bit later. And to return to this current part of the story, Semmelweis did not back down in the face of all this opposition. In 1848, he started requiring that medical students clean all the instruments that were used during labor and delivery with chlorinated lime as well. The clinic had already had a month where there had been no deaths. And at this point, the ongoing mortality rate from childbed fever at the hospital dropped almost to zero. As doctors continued to dismiss his findings, Semmelweis became increasingly hostile and combative. And simultaneously, uprisings were sweeping through the area as people protested against the Habsburg dynasty and the Austrian Empire. Students held a demonstration in Vienna on March 13, 1848, and the Hungarian Revolution of 1848 began two days later. Although there's no evidence that Semmelweis was part of these demonstrations, many of his student supporters were, which probably inflamed tensions between him and the rest of the faculty. As we said earlier, that position he had at the maternity clinic and at the hospital had been a two-year appointment. And in 1849, the hospital elected not to renew it. He was instead offered a position that had no contact with cadavers. In 1850, he left Vienna to return home without announcing his departure or saying goodbye to anyone he knew. We're going to talk about Semmelweis's life back in Hungary after we first pause for another sponsor break. In 1851, Ignaz Semmelweis was named head of obstetrics at St. Rocha's Hospital, although this was really an honorary and unpaid position. He did hold it for the next few years, though, during which time the rate of childbed fever at the hospital dropped significantly. In the mid-1850s, Semmelweis left St. Rocha's and became a professor at Pest University. In 1857, he married Maria Weidenhofer, and they went on to have five children together. During these years, Semmelweis continued to advocate for hand-washing after autopsies, and he also wrote a series of extremely hostile open letters to the doctors who dismissed his ideas, calling them murderers who were responsible for the deaths of women through their negligence. This seems to me like a very fair assessment, (laughs) but... Uh, But people began to increasingly think he is just uh, an angry man that no one should listen to. He wrote things like, you, Herr Professor, have been a partner in this massacre. And should you, Herr Hofrath, without having disproved my doctrine, continue to train your pupils against it, I declare before God and the world that you are a murderer and the history of childbed fever would not be unjust to you if it memorialized you as a medical Nero. In 1858, after years of his supporters telling him he should publish his work, he published The Etiology of Childbed Fever. Another work, The Difference in Opinion Between Myself and the English Physicians Regarding Childbed Fever, followed in 1860. And in 1861, he published a book called The Etiology, the Concept, and the Prophylaxis of Childbed Fever. In places, this was a clear and well-written treatise on childbed fever. But large portions were actually diatribes against his critics, some of them rambling, repetitive, and almost nonsensical. Ignaz Semmelweis had been described as abrasive, dogmatic, and even rude for most of his career. But by the time this book came out, he was also starting to behave erratically. This got worse in the early 1860s, and on July 13th, 1865, he returned home from a family outing and was behaving so bizarrely that his wife became convinced that something was seriously wrong with him. And then on July 21st, he went to a meeting at his job where, among other things, he was supposed to talk about candidates for a vacant lecturer's post And according to his former assistant, instead, he read a piece of paper containing the midwife's oath of practice 
clearly unaware that he was doing anything amiss. Semmelweis planned to go to a spa and take water treatments there, and he departed with his wife and some attendants on July 29th. But the next day, for reasons that aren't entirely clear, he was instead committed to a public institution, where he died on August 13th, 1865, at the age of 47. He was buried in Vienna two days later. There are some conflicting reports about what happened at the institution. In some accounts, he became so violent that he had to be restrained, and during that encounter, he was injured. But in others, he was severely beaten by guards and then left without any kind of medical treatment. Regardless of exactly what happened, an injury to his finger that he either had when he got to the hospital or sustained in the incident became infected. An autopsy that was performed at Vienna Allgemeine Krankenhaus diagnosed, quote, paralysis of the brain as his cause of death. Today, it seems likely to have been septicemia, but the autopsy also revealed that he had severe injuries that do suggest that he had been beaten. It's also not clear what caused his behavior to become so erratic in the last years of his life. Theories range from the continual stress of being such a pariah in the medical community to early-onset Alzheimer's to late-stage syphilis, which was an occupational hazard of being an obstetrician at a busy hospital at this point in history. In the later years of Simmelweis's life, other doctors were also working on ideas that were related to contagion and the germ theory of disease. In 1850, two years after Semmelweis instituted hand-washing at the Vienna General Hospital, James Young Simpson of Scotland published a detailed description of how materies morbi could be introduced into the body during labor and delivery, and how the postpartum body was primed for infection and because of the dilation and abrasion sustained during birth. He even made the comparison between the attendant's fingers and the ivory points that were that had been used to administer smallpox vaccinations by transferring material from a cowpox lesion to a person's skin. In the 1850s and 60s, Louis Pasteur was studying how microorganisms caused beer and wine to spoil. In 1867, Joseph Lister began publishing work on preventing infection during surgery, which included hygiene and hand-washing with carbolic. Ten years prior to that, in 1857, Robert Koch made the connection between the anthrax disease and the anthrax bacterium. And later, he helped articulate four criteria to prove that a disease is caused by a specific microorganism, which are called Koch's postulates today. These criteria are that the microorganism is always associated with the disease, that it can be taken from a diseased animal and grown in a culture, that the cultured organism can cause the disease in a healthy animal, and that the same microorganism can be collected from the newly diseased animal. So based on the work of Louis Pasteur, Joseph Lister, Robert Koch, and others, infection control finally became a routine part of obstetrics in the 1880s. But these researchers don't appear to have been influenced by Semmelweis's work at all. In a lot of cases, they hadn't even heard of him until long after they did their first groundbreaking work. He faded into obscurity after his death until a Hungarian doctor published a paper about him in 1887. Today, there are lots of hospitals and clinics named after Ignaz Semmelweis, along with the Semmelweis Medical Historical Museum in Budapest. And at some point, some unknown person coined the Semmelweis reflex to describe a rejection of new information because it contradicts established norms. Even though puerperal fever is much less of an issue for a lot of the world today than it was in 19th century Europe, hospital-acquired infections are still an issue even in the most affluent parts of the world. Known as nosocomial infections, they're the most common complication in hospitalized people. They happen in between 5 and 10 percent of acute care patients, and hand-washing is a huge part of preventing them. Yay for hand washing. Yes, please wash your hands. This uh, this story reminds me a little bit of Fritz Wiki, where somebody is really clearly onto something and their contemporaries are like, nope, nope, nope. And it makes them frustrated and in a little bit uh, mad just yeah. from having to having to fight against that all the time. Yeah, some um, of the some of the uh the things that I read about him that have been written more recently 
almost have a victim blamey aspect to them. They, they're they sort of like, if he hadn't been such a jerk about it, people might have listened to him. And I'm like, women were literally dying. And he was like, who cares how it works? Washing your hands keeps the women from dying. Why won't you just do it? And like, I, I'm like, that understandably made him really angry. <laughs> well, and it, it is kind of hard to understand how like people were not getting the pattern recognition of everywhere he went and instituted his practices mortality went down and so clearly <laughs> something was correct uh so it seems weird that they would continue to be like nope 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 not nope. my hands i'm a gentleman uh <laughs> do you have less infuriating listener mail i do this is from taylor uh it is about our 1,000th episode two-parter on Sadako Sasaki. And Taylor says, Hi, Tracy and Holly. I just finished listening to your wonderful two-parter on Sadako Sasaki. This is of particular interest interest and significance to me because I've been living in Japan for a little over a year now as an English teacher. Uh, Taylor goes on to talk about living close enough to Hiroshima to be able to get there pretty quickly by bullet train and going to the museum and the atomic bomb dome. Uh, the Memorial Museum is, as you can imagine, horrifying, but by the end, it is hopeful, featuring, as of last year, a crane on display made by President Obama, as well as a visitor book where you can leave thoughts and messages about the need for peace for all, and for all countries to do away with nuclear warfare. There's a good display in the museum on Sadako, featuring a timeline of her life and several of her cranes, including some of those very tiny ones folded by pins. It was surreal and very poignant to see them. And when you exit the museum into the Peace Park, there is the statue of Sadako holding a crane. And then surrounding the bell you mentioned are display cases full of cranes, sent usually by school children from all over the world to honor Sadako. Of all colors and sizes, many just strung together in bunches of a thousand, but sometimes arranged into artwork pieces. I've attached some photos from my trips. I'm sure they look the same as any photo you could Google, but they're breathtaking. When you go to the Memorial Museum, along with your ticket, you are giving a postcard with paper made out of recycled cranes from these displays. Most big shrines I've gotten to visit in Japan have at least one area where strings of cranes are displayed for good health and healing and good fortune, and of course, with Sadako in mind. Another quick note about the terrain and weather in this specific region of Japan. It is very hilly slash mountainous. It depends on how you define a mountain. I've described this terrain to friends and family as pretty visually similar to West Virginia. Presumably, this would have made it pretty difficult to flee the city after the bombing, as many did, especially in August when the heat and humidity are very oppressive. I've gone hiking in the summer and the humidity gets up to 100% sometimes, and it feels like you're trying to breathe underwater. It's really unlike anything I've experienced in the USA. The same goes weather-wise for Nagasaki, being much further southwest. One last addendum to a very long email. On a recent trip to Kyoto, I learned by a tour guide that the reason this city's hundreds of temples, shrines, and historical sites, some very ancient, survived World War II, was the fact that the United States recognized the historical and cultural significance that these sites held and thus did not firebomb Kyoto. I haven't verified this information, but it's but it's fascinating. Taylor goes on to uh, offer up some thanks. Uh, So thank you, Taylor. So I wanted to read this for a couple of reasons. One is that we have gotten a lot of really great email after those two-part episodes. A lot of people who either live in Hiroshima or have visited Hiroshima or have done crane folding projects with their classes. So many of them, and they've been so wonderful to read. And these pictures that Taylor sent are beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, And I also did want to follow up on the point made about Kyoto. So um, it is interesting that When they were choosing where to drop the atomic bomb, Kyoto was actually at the top of the list for a long time because of its cultural significance. Like, it had not been touched by firebombing until that point, but the the train of thought was, oh, it would be so culturally devastating to destroy such a historically important city with all of these very important religious sites and historical buildings. Maybe we should drop the bomb there. Uh, but the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, had visited uh, Kyoto with his wife earlier in his lifetime, and he kept insisting that it was too beautiful to protect and they should not drop the bomb on it. 
And the rest of the committee that was making these decisions kept being like, but seriously, dude, that will be the most devastating place. And so it was not so much that the United States recognized the cultural value of Kyoto. It was that uh, Henry Stimson objected to what his committee was telling him was the best plan and eventually got them to choose a different place. So... Uh, if you'd like to write to us about this or any other podcast, we're at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. And then we're on all over social media at Missed in History. So you can find us on Facebook and Pinterest and Instagram and Twitter. You can come to our website, which is MissedInHistory.com, where you will find show notes for all the episodes Holly and I have ever done together. There's a search bar up at the top where you can look for episodes that are interesting to you. There's also an archive of every episode we have ever done. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and wherever else you find podcasts. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 